Hello and welcome to the Arthur B. Morrow Institute for Peace and Justice at St. Paul's College at the University of Manitoba. On behalf of the director of the Morrow Institute, uh, Dr. Katharina Standish, I'm Jason Brennan, and I welcome you to today's lecture. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Indian Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Today's lecture is taking place both in person and online, and the lecture is being recorded for future broadcasts on the Moore Institute YouTube channel. The lecture will include a 30 to 35 minute presentation followed by a question and answer session. Online viewers are asked to type their questions in the Q&A box on the Zoom platform. Once I've identified those questions, I may allow you to use your microphone and bring voice to your questions. Our lecturer today, Dr. Laura rosenoff galvin Assistant Professor of Anthropology here at the University of Manitoba. In a moment, my, I will call upon my friend, Dr. Shana Plout, the uh, Director of Research and Exhibition Development at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, to introduce Dr. rosenoff galvin and set the table for today's lecture. A few points of interest to share before we begin. Our founder and principal benefactor, Dr. Arthur Morrill, He's a graduate of both St. Paul's College and the University of Manitoba's Faculty of Law. His passing this summer at the age of 96 marks the end of an era. Until the pandemic, Dr. Moore would often spend time with the graduate students and share his reflections and vision for peace and justice in our world. We were blessed by his gifts, his vision, and his presence. We invite you to join us at St. Paul's College next Wednesday, October 18th, for a memorial mass at 11.45 a.m. in Christ the King Chapel in honor of the life of Dr. Morrill. Following the service, we'll, we will provide a light lunch in Hanley Hall. Please RSVP your attendance if you hope to attend the lunch to STC Foundation at Manitoba.ca. That's Wednesday, October 18th, 1145 Mass, followed by lunch. Thank you for attending today. This is the first of three upcoming brown bag lectures. Uh, I invite you to visit our website to see them all, and uh, all the registration links are on our website. I'll also ask you to consider making, marking your calendars for the 2023 Sol Kami Lecture for Peace and Justice, our first since 2018, featuring Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire. His lecture, Peace, Faith, and Humanity in Times of Crisis, will be held on Thursday, November 9th, 1.30 p.m. here at the University of Manitoba. But today, today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Laura rosenoff galvin to the Brown Bank Lecture Podium, and I invite Dr. Shana Flout to introduce our lecturer. I am really humbled today uh, to, to be here. And those of you who know me know that humility doesn't always come easily. But I'm, I'm really humbled because um, I, used to, I used to work here. Um, I did my graduate studies with, with Laura. Uh, we, worked, we all worked together um, on making this book. And in this process of making this book, we, did, we went from, uh, there's five of us editors, we went from being some of us friends, some of us colleagues, to becoming closer, to becoming more supportive. And those of you who have been in academia for a long time know that when you're working together for four years on an academic project, you rarely hear that you become closer friends and more collegial and more respectful and more supportive. So I really am humbled here because I feel like I am speaking with and introducing a process um, that is by no means uh, just my own. Um, this is, a, this is a, a book called Messy Ethics in Human Rights Work. And I think that it is only telling that we are having this conversation um, on, the, on Treaty One land, on the land of the Métis, uh, on the Métis Nation, of where we are constantly engaged in very messy ethics about what is right, who is right, to whom are we accountable, to whom do we work with and in what way. Acknowledging not just mistakes of the past and mistakes of the present, but the inevitable mistakes of the future that will be made. We're also in the, in, in the midst of an ongoing war that is taking place right now in the Middle East, of which many people think that they are right. And the consequences of many people thinking that they are right in unequal power relations means that many people have and will continue to lose their lives. And I'm situating this because it was real life that brought us to this book. 
I have taught uh, in some way or another, or you know, working in some way or another with students in the field of human rights since 2000. Like I'm old, but like that makes me feel like really old. You know, so since 2000, I've been working in designing and mentoring and supervising and cleaning up the messes of in learning from students who are teaching human rights, who are doing internships in human rights, who are doing practicums in human rights, who look with to me in some ways as if I can offer guidance in their research on human rights. And these students have been amazing teachers. And one of the ways that they taught me is that they were consistently facing the same fears, the same hesitations, the same stumbles before they went in the field and when I would debrief and meet with them afterwards, after they returned. There was a pattern in what was going on and what they were scared of and what they, mistakes that they thought that they would make and mistakes that they did make in, oh my God, what just happened here? I thought I was making things better. I suddenly made things totally worse. What just happened? Why didn't anyone talk to me in the room? Why didn't anyone say thank you? Why did people look at me like a savior? I'm only a student. All of these things were happening over and over again. And this didn't matter if they were working in communities outside of themselves or if they were working in communities of which they had relations. So it, 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 the, the, the internal, external, the flavor may be different, but there was still that pattern of, of, of fears and hesitations and stumbles. And um, I would always say to them, like, it's not bad what you went through. This is part of the process. But I realized as an educator, as people that may have just been one or two steps ahead of them, just because I've made more mistakes than they have, you know, that I had failed in preparing them for this. I had failed in letting them know you will make mistakes. You will be uncomfortable. Things will not be clear. And I had not provided those preparatory tools. And thus, they were not expecting that. So they were coming back feeling shame or feeling alone or feeling like the only one who has ever made this mistake, confused, rather than recognizing that it was part of the process. And I happened to, you know, you know, I was thinking about this, and that birthed a course called um, Ethics and Qualitative Methods of Human Rights Work uh, that I, I, I conducted at, uh, at Simon Fraser University in 2015. And I conducted that course and once again learned so much from my students in what they went through that course. One of it is like, Shana, there is only 24 hours in the day. Stop it. Like, you know, and I was like, oh, right, okay. So I learned so much from that. And I made those kinds of relations. But then I also had conversations with my friends who are also my colleagues, who are also in some ways my relations. And I had conversations with people with whom I was introduced to. Um, Christina Clark Kozak, who I was introduced to by Professor Lori Wilkinson here, where I was told, you guys have the most opposite personalities but similar values, maybe you should talk. And it was at the Strangers of, oh thanks, I know. You know, the Strangers in Homelands, you know, conference when I first moved to Winnipeg. And then, Christina would talk to her colleague, Maritza, um, Feliz Lunes at University of Ottawa. And then Christina talked to her, to her student, Neil Boletta, who was at McGill and is now at University of North Carolina. And we realized that we had all been learning in the same way about the importance of transparency, the importance of vulnerability, the importance of admitting publicly that we don't know and that we are learning and that this is a process of learning. This is part of the process of learning. And that's what this book is. It is the start, it is an invitation to conversations. It is a start, it is an invitation to learn from the 13 different contributors about patterns and, and tools and things that worked and things that didn't work 
and how you could then apply it in your own human rights work. And just one, um, one note on the terminology. We say human rights work because we're talking about human rights research, we're talking about human rights teaching, we're talking about pract like practitioners, so folks who are social workers or who are journalists, we're talking about artists, we're talking about art making, we're talking about all of that together in human rights work. And I can think of nobody better than my friend, my colleague, um, I don't know, my good person, you know, um, uh, Dr. Rosenau Colvin, who is reflecting on her own journeys and her own process and the expectations that were placed on what good human rights scholarship should look like and to whom she is actually accountable. Thank you. Shana, thank you for bringing me up to this book project. It was through COVID years and through illnesses and deaths in the family and births in the family and all of us together just supported each other, the co-authors. It's one of the best kind of academic relationships and projects that I've been a part of. And so I just want to honor that here. Um, and also say that when I was invited into the work and then thinking about the chapter I wanted to write, I decided to write about um, in a sense, the violence of academia. Even though I had you know, studied for many years, learned from people in northern Uganda who had lived through war, learned from my grandmother who had survived the Holocaust, and continuing that learning here with indigenous elders and knowledge keepers on campus as we take part in rematriating indigenous ancestors that are on this campus, all this, you know, all the real world violence that exists, and somehow, and you'll have to excuse me, I decided to write about the violence of academia through all that. And I think partially, you know, many people have written about it, and there's amazing indigenous scholars who have done so. Um, but it was something that I was still challenged by as I went through and continue to go through being a professional academic. Okay, a lot of this centered upon um, relationships and the relationships I had, both my own growing up. Um, Mother, a Holocaust survivor, and a family, um, navigating my grandmother, and the relationships that I made through my research, through my learning work in northern Uganda. And this is a picture of Augustine and I. And Augustine will be here any moment. He actually has a class on campus. He came to Canada this summer to do a master's in human rights. Um, but I've known Augustine since 2006 when I first started going to northern Uganda. And over the years, we've worked together. I've been with his family and his clan. They were my main teachers in over the 17 years I've been there. Um, and they survived over 20 years of conflict and displacement off their ancestral lands. And I'll get a bit more into it, but um, I really started thinking about how academia would like or was trying, my encounters at least, to erase these relationships within my family and with the people who I learned from over these years. And I'll go a little bit into that, so just bear with me as we go. And hopefully Augustine will get here soon. So first, um, I always situate myself as the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, immigrants, settlers to this land. Um, I was born in Montreal. Most of my family on my maternal side did not make it past the World War II Holocaust. My father's side came from Eastern Europe, also fleeing pogroms of violence, but it raised very much within a family that had fled violence and was living through it, like so many people in this world who are living through violence. And so I came to questions about how do people live through violence? What does social repair or relational repair look like? Does that have anything to do with these like international transitional justice processes? Like I think that's those were the questions I kind of ended up in as I was doing my study. Um, and I ended up in northern Uganda. Originally, I wasn't a grad student. I finished my undergrad in communication studies from Concordia, and I was working as a photographer and a filmmaker. And I was invited to be part of a film about the war in Uganda. The war lasted from 1986 to 2006. I won't go into it too much. Brutal, brutal war. Um, and we worked with community groups there at Choli that people self identified the Chuli tribes. Um, 
we work for them to tell the story of what that war was and what they wanted people to understand. And so this is some years after I went back to graduate school, <coughs> um, worked in a long time in an internally displaced persons camp in the north. And that's where I first met Augustine um, and his family. And then at the time I you know, finished my master's degree, there were a lot of questions from his community about moving back to their ancestral land. The war had ended, there was a ceasefire, people were moving back after 10 to 20 years away depending where it was. And so I just wanted to introduce that this is the home that I did, you know, repeatedly return to, but also lived at for about eight months in 2012. And that's uh, my host mother there. <clears throat> During the war, people were internally displaced in these camps. And as people were returning home, what I heard from people who I had met and lived with and shared with over the years, is they weren't so concerned about international juridical processes of holding perpetrators accountable. It was also a, sorry, it was a war that pitted people within the same family against each other. So it was this like forced inter-clan, family to family violence. But they were more concerned with how, was, how to live together again in the good, like every day, because that's what was necessary, what is necessary. And the woman featured there, Beatrice, who I've known her since she was 15, and this was in the camp when I first met her. She was, we worked on photography projects together. And we talked about where we were going to have them. And I said, would you like to do something in Uganda and Kampala and the nearest town? And she said, you know, I have nothing to say to people here. They know my story. They have lived through it. A massive amount of youth were abducted or brought into the military to fight the abduction. She instead wanted to learn what it was like to live in the village on her ancestral land, how to live on the land in that way, how to be a good Acholi woman, as she said. And then in speaking to Augustine's family as well, who had started to return home, I spoke to another woman, Margaret Acha, who also talked about this concern about youth who grew up in the camps away from their land and what it would be like after 20 years to then expect them to function in a mostly small-scale farming agriculture community. And so I went into the PhD from these questions and said, okay, well, I, if I could be useful in any way, let me know. And so I, I was invited to Augustine's village by his family. The village is its not a good word for it because it's also a clan. It's their ancestral territories. Um, and I won't go into too much here, but all these questions and projects we did, um, people wanted us to do a history of the clan. And so youth were interviewing the elders. We did a workbook that was given out to everybody. We did different types of methods that was useful to their own efforts. And so, okay, great, like, beautiful. <laughs> there was problems, of course, but um, very interesting methods. And then I go back to the university. I was at the University of British Columbia doing a PhD. I ended up in cultural anthropology somehow. <laughs> um, I started in communications and then did fine arts and then ended up in cultural anthropology. And as I was speaking about what I learned from the clan, Pabwatch clan, and the back clan. I spoke about how the return to ancestral land provoked multi generational engagements with the Chile indigenous knowledge, which to me was exactly what I learned. And so, if you're how do people live and how do they live together, it was by engaging with a Chile indigenous knowledge, which of course is indigenous governance and law. And what I spoke about it back then, I spoke about Acholi terms, tequaro, which is culture and indigenous knowledge, knowledge of the ancestors is how it directly translates. Rocho wat is relational repair. And ribe kaha, which is clan unity. And these were really the teachings that I was taught, that were being taught to youth, to even the adults who had been displaced, and who were coming back to the land to together after terrible acts of violence, and sometimes ongoing. Again, it's, you know, actually indigenous governance is, is, is what basically I was exposed to and what I started to speak about as how people move on after war in these areas. And the reaction I got from people on my committee, 
from conference presentations, people in the audience, uh, from journals, reviews of the work that I tried to honor the teachings um, that I thought of watch, that the Pavwaj clan taught me was astounding. And I'll read you some of them, which I wrote actually in the chapter. This is, but where is the violence? Where is the violence? How can you say that violence is unimportant? Surely this community is not as organized as you say, as you say. Or if they are, they are surely the exception, exceptional, exceptionally organized. You mean communal land rights, land rights, land rights, land rights are important to post-war social reconstruction? Oh, so maybe USAID shouldn't be having private property workshops right now? I believe that the community is organized and as rational as you say, but that's incredible, as I've also heard about witch burnings happening only three hours away. Things and infighting and murder. Where is that? Where is the violence in your article? Where is the violence in this community? But, but, but where is the violence? You can't tell me that people don't get into fights when drinking sometimes, can you? How can you say that violence is unimportant? I'm emotionally even reading it because it's not only uh, offensive and racist and white supremacist and continuing to enforce perspectives that there is no indigenous governance on the African continent. 23, <laughs> like, um, but it's also extremely violent, and I see those acts as violence. And again, there are many, particularly indigenous scholars who write to us, <laughs> who talk about damage-centered research, you know, who talk about ethnographic refusal, it's Tadra Simpson. And reading their work really made me be able to situate this kind of violence in a better way as I encountered people's just astonishment about a Chilean indigenous government, which sounds ridiculous. <laughs> but it wasn't an isolated incident. Um, I'm just going to move on here. I'm going to skip this for now because Augustine is in here. And I'll just speak a bit about these relationships. And so Santina, the aunt, my aunt, she lived also in the homestead with us. And then um, Augustine's mother and father his mother and father. Um, there were many incidents over the time that I've known them, but particularly when I was living in their, on their land. Um, and Santina particularly was very outspoken and was very much my teacher. And I was leaving once to go into the center, which was about eight kilometers away. And she looked at me, she always looked me up and down before I left, and she said, you know, button your shirt. You have to clean your shoes. You can't go like that. And I was like, but my shoes are fine. I'm like 37, by the way, at that time. <laughs> she says, no, you represent us now. And when you go out there, they will judge us and our clan by how you comport yourself. And so in the end, like these are the people who I will represent with my writing in any scholarship that I'll do. Sorry, with any scholarship that I'll do. And so in the, in the midst of this kind of barrage of this incredulous idea that a truly indigenous governance exists, um, I just kept writing to them. And I just kept honoring those relationships and the teachings and what they themselves, you know, Kaha, Ribe Kaha. And you, oh, Augustine's here. Okay, <laughs> we'll bring him in. Um, and I just kept writing to them. Part of it also, and I'll just move back a bit to my own family, is when I was writing my PhD thesis, I also wrote about my positionality and how I grew up and how that impacted how I came to think about relational repair and living through and after violence. And folks on my committee, not everyone, one person in particular, kept wanting me to take it out. They said, readers cannot hold an event like the Holocaust next to an event like war, this terrible war, in Uganda, and I was really puzzled, and I refused to remove it because it 
extremely important. It's important for how I interact. I am and just understand life and am in this world. Came to the defense, I was questioned on all the things I've already spoke about. And then for my final revision, that one committee member said, you have to take up part of the program. Oh. Are you not going to pass me? He's like, no, you have to do that. So my positionality, the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor, became like a footnote in my thesis. Um, and so now, of course, I vow to honor those relationships and the relationships in Pub Watch um, as I move about and do my work. And so within this chapter, I really just try to think through those things and to think also and acknowledge these incredible scholars who have already been talking this for a long time. Um, and I just want to invite, because he's just come in, if you don't mind coming up, Augustine. <laughs> you might be shy, but no, no. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> it's just it. So come on. Well, okay, I think you have to come behind you and put it here. Okay. Um, so actually, that is Augustine's family. <laughs> family, <laughs> as we're here. <laughs> we were going to do uh, more back and forth, but I know you, of course, as I do. But I just want to pass it to you um, a little bit. Of, yeah. I'll just say Augustine is now studying um, in Canada. He is now staying with my family, just as I did with his. And I'm happy to come in, so we can talk about this together. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm uh, August Nixon-Zero, uh, currently a student of the uh, Human Rights Faculty of Law. Uh, sorry for coming in a bit late. I grew up uh, in northern Uganda, <coughs> Pub Watch, where she did her uh, studies. I participated in uh, drafting um, a constitution. It's a local governance uh, tool that is being used currently. But I also participated in other activities that are meant to uh, modernize and let people resettle well after the decades of war in uh, northern Uganda. And uh, particularly for the land constitution, I participated in drafting it. I translated it into the local language. Why did we decide to do that? First of all, the war in northern Uganda disintegrated the community of Abwech. And uh, secondly, it uh, created family disunity. At some point also in the camp, we stayed for over 20 years, there were children who were born in the camp, there were children who were born in the bush. When we came back and we were resettling, there were issues of now getting everyone to resettle within the confinement of the, uh, of the household, the clans, and the family. And there were also uprising issues in regard to land. Of course, we hold customary system of land ownership, where land is normally uh, managed locally by the community. And uh, management is, in most cases, informal, not written down. So deciding to have it written down was to guide in the process of heading equal distribution of land <laughs> among the orphans, the widows, and all the members of the <coughs> clans of Pabuch. We did many other activities. We had cultural revival activities that were meant to bridge the gaps between the, the younger generation and the older generation. We did it through music, dance, and drama, and many other activities that uh, I participated in while uh, she was also doing uh, academic research work. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just come back to, you know, at that point in 2012, um, the community had been back on their ancestral lands between three and four agricultural cycles. And really this idea of Ribe Kaha is bringing clan unity or bringing the clan together. Um, Augustine talked a little bit about it, but it was really what for me was the most important lesson if you're thinking about relational repair, living through violence in this particular context and other contexts. And it really brought up also this 
it's a very fundamental idea about indigenous land rights, the truly indigenous land rights, which again was not even in the conversation um, locally. Locally, of course, it was, <laughs> um, but internationally. And so groups like USAID were holding private property workshops and, and other things like that. And so I also have a picture of Binao. He's one of the elders who always, he was teaching songs as part of these activities. Um, but he al always talked about this idea of Libe Kaha. And for him, what the goal was, and maybe always, but particularly to me and my questions about relational repair and living through the violence. And so it wasn't so much a dilemma for me, I think, the work. It was more just, which many of you face, and if you haven't faced, will face, challenges in being an academic, doing human rights work. And it might not be challenges in the field, although many do, people do speak to that, challenges in community. But for me, it was more the challenge of doing it in an academic context and whether that was appropriate and whether that was an intervention that was worthwhile um, and how to speak to that. And so, yeah, I'd like to turn it back. I don't know if Sheena would, would want to open it or if you're moderating it, but. The idea of the book is to really have these conversations more broadly about dilemmas, about questions, about possibly irresolvable <coughs> dilemmas that you encounter while doing this kind of work. Conclusion. Huh? Like our conclusion. Like our conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> like our conclusion. That really just asks questions um, with people answering it. And next week, in two weeks, sorry, at the book launch, um, the book launch itself will be having different people grapple with some of the questions that we ask. And so I'd like to turn it over now if there are questions or comments or if someone also wants to share, like whatever people are comfortable with and how best you can use your time. I thank you for listening. I thank you for being here from your class. <laughs>
I had to go and bolt it and to go and take cover while talking from a, a wall. So I was asking, who are you? So there was no answer. I got nervous. Then I got down to the downstairs to pick up my phone so that I maybe I call Lara and uh, probably Ryan. Uh, <laughs> When I got down, I text, I call, there were no responses. Probably the phone was somewhere, she was so unable to. I got so nervous. At some point, Ryan got uh, the text I sent and was able to write back and to check. The person was our good neighbor. Unfortunately, I think he had some bit of hearing problem. He couldn't hear me very well when I was talking inside. So. When Ryan came and he said, at first when he tried pushing the door, I had to resist and push it back until when the person talks. And then Ryan said, I'm the one, you open. And I allowed him to come in. <clears throat> then he was telling me, this is our good neighbor here. We don't have to worry about security of our places. The neighbor was coming to check in something. That was how I got a bit relieved. And he was like, go and you can say hello to the person. So I was wondering what will I now say to this, our good neighbor. So this experience, of course, stemmed up from my uh, very bad experience of one time from where I stay, where there are criminals who came in, broke into a house. They removed all the things and they beat the owner of the house to come up. The yes. guy to pretend that he's ready, no more he's dead. That was when they, they left him, and that is how he survived. Uh, my sense of security uh, and also self-protection. I lived in northern Uganda where during the Hillary war you had to do everything possible to protect yourself, much as I know the government had the obligation to protect me because I was underage. I escaped arrest for like three, four times where the Hillary level would come and they attacked because they wanted the young children because grooming them into the rebel activity was easier. So I escaped arrest like three times. So I had that sense of self-protection. So all this experience probably to me explained why I was nervous to this our good neighbor. Now, I read from the chapter uh, the concern of the supervisors being requesting that this should be pulled out. And I was now wondering, what do our experiences, what role do they play in uh, academic research? Do they have a role to play or do they have disconnect? This is a pending question that runs on, on my mind, given my experience that made me to behave the way I behaved here in Canada. Of course, in Uganda, uh, self-protection, you will find someone will build a house and put on the window and the door, steel doors, and even still put in burglar proof. And someone will again continue and build wall fence just for self-protection. And on the wall fence, you will find again electric wire for protection. So these are experiences that like eh, make us sometimes to do the things the way we do. So it gives me some bit of hesitation. I don't know if someone can, if it is like an ethical issue, our experience in relating it to the academic work we do. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think, I, thank you. Well, I think that's it. Like some people expect you to separate your own experiences. Like that research should. I mean, I don't think anyone believes it should be objective, but obviously, I think those ideas are still pervasive in certain ways. And I think you're right. Like who you are, it's everything. It manifests in everything that you do. I have a question online, and I'm going to turn on that person's microphone if they want to bring voice to their question. If they don't speak, I'll read their question for them. I'll read the question. Can you talk about the way your research unfolded as activities and goals that were a benefit to the community? <laughs> you want me to start? OK. Um, Sure, yeah, because I had known Augustine and his family for a long time already <coughs> by the time I was starting the PhD research. Uh, really, I got to speak with many people, including Augustine, about 
how I could be useful in my time there. And so one of, I could speak, a, I'll just briefly talk and then you can speak more. One of them was Augustine had started a youth group while in the displacement camp in Cadide and then wanted to do more activities now that people had gone back home, and I'll let you speak more about that, but what he gestured to cultural revival activities. And I was lucky enough to have a scholarship at the time, so I was like, okay, great, so let's fund, let's fund this group. And you could, you know, a bunch of youth that were working together could do this amazing program that they did carry out. And that was part of my learning <laughs> and research. That was one of the methods, I guess you could say. Um, the second was this workbook which again came about because in speaking to more adults and elders, they really wanted to have their history written down. Um, and they also always talked about having the different generations together after the war, particularly in engaging them in Tikwa, indigenous knowledge or culture. And so youth, um, and Augustine was with me too, would interview the elders and sit and hear these stories so they could be written down and participated in the songs that were recorded and different aspects. So there was also this workbook, I guess you could call it. We uh, gave one to every household in 2015, too. That was another, um, and you know, we did, uh, we did do a full survey also when we visited every household and asked them about their experiences of when they went to the camp and when they came home and different ideas about what Tequavo is and what's important. But then one of the things that also happened was, sorry, I'll just show you quickly the image of Augustine's um, parents. It was their 25th wedding anniversary. It was their 25th wedding anniversary and they asked me to take a portrait. And I would take a lot of pictures, but they're usually not full portraits. So they told me what kind of picture they wanted and I took a picture of them for their wedding anniversary, and I came, I had to come back to Canada, and I came back and I was able to bring them a printed photo of the frame. And then other people saw the image and really wanted one as well, because printing is still pretty expensive. And so I ended up also doing, like going and visiting with people and taking their portraits in the village back on their land. Um, and that became, I guess, another method if you want to be technical about it, but things I spent my time doing. And in that, when I, did finally write this thesis. <laughs> um, I also <laughs> I also had a, a, a photo exhibit, and I because to me everything we're talking about Libe Kaha and the importance of land and land rights and being back on the land. To me, the photo is also reflects that mm -hmm. not being defined by the violence. Yes, the violence occurred and people lived through it, but not being defined. And so I had um, the picture of uh, Mama and Baba, and then one of Cesarina Angelo, actually Augustine's aunt and uncle, and then a picture of Beatrice and her husband. So three like different, the young couple, um, the middle-aged couple, and then an elderly couple together, and the bit from behind. And so that was another part of the work. Um, Well, just to add on to during the processes of the research work, there were issues that were coming up prominently, and uh, particularly the generational gap that was in between the, gen the current generation, the younger generation, and the, uh, the other generation. They were coming up to be prominently as challenges that were affecting the, the return into the villages. Uh, into their homes. That's why we initiated the, the idea of social repair and cultural revival through the uh, music, dance, and uh, uh, drama program. The program was basically aimed to address some of the key challenges that we were, we were getting, although we were not aiming to achieve it all at once, but we were trying to also do something which is uh, needful in regard to that. And uh, given the fact that most of our history are orally kept, we decided that it would be necessary to document uh, history, particularly Upper Watch, in a booklet so that the younger generation, they are able to go with it to school, able to read it and to get to know what, where we have been from and uh, probably where we are yet to go. And you also did a cultural festival. Yes. So they worked, the youth, the youth group worked in five villages, I believe? 
and had wangos around the fire, invited elders in different villages to tell the story and history of their clans and the land. Um, there was also this big cultural festival where each of the five groups from the five villages presented food and song. There was a cooking contest with traditional foods because in the camp, they relied on USA mostly, food program, world food program. And so the traditional foods was also a very big thing. Another question online. I'm going to invite uh, Liz, if you'd like, you can ask your question. If I don't hear your voice, Liz, I will read it for you. I uh, happily read your question. I'll do my best. Um, <coughs> as researchers discussing cultural violence in often dangerous areas, do you feel a greater sense of urgency for outsiders to collect the stories from these communities because you can retreat to the safety of your home country. That distance, I suppose, she's talking about. Or is the persistent ethical dilemma with being an outsider researching indigenous populations a barrier to new researchers, i.e. funders and so forth? So that, that relationship as an outsider. Liz, you, you, you can bring more to your question if you like, Liz, but that's how I read your question. So like the work I was doing was not documenting that's not what the community asked me to do, and so that's not what I did, <laughs> um, either before and thinking about the question and then when we were actually there and doing the method. So I think more being an outsider, at least I'd like to think about it, was presenting an opportunity to do these projects that suited what they wanted to do. And I think for me as a researcher, that's really important, is if I could be useful to what people are already doing, if, if I could be useful. So I, I, I don't know your question, whether it relates or whether you want me to think about it as it doesn't relate, but maybe Augustine could address that in thinking about a researcher who comes from outside to document stories of violence. Is there something, and Liz, you could speak more. I think your question is, is there something about having someone from outside do the documentation rather than... Hi. Sorry, my voice is a little gone. That's why I didn't unmute before. Um, yeah, it's just basically as a researcher working outside of your home community, we're told as new researchers to be, you know, extra careful about what we're doing. Um, and that did you feel a, a greater safety in knowing that you can go back home if let's say war were to break out again? And do you think it's a barrier for new researchers going into some communities if they are outsiders to those communities? I understand. Sorry, I think I misinterpreted it before. Um, I don't know if it's a barrier or not. Um, I think, like for me, foremost is if if I if I'm useful there or if I'm causing more of a burden in an already burdensome situation. Like there were occasions um, before Pep Watch, but during the war when I was with the film crew, for example, and I, we had to, to document what was going on during the war, we had to travel with the convoy that was delivering the food. It was a military convoy. So that in itself is an ethical dilemma of like whether you travel with one side to be able to reach people. Um, that could provide security. But then the convoy got stuck because it was raining and the military who were there had to focus a lot of security because there were foreigners, we weren't all white, but white people and other foreigners who were in an internally displaced persons camp at a very hot time of war. And so that question about is it actually, you know, are you pulling reason, like, why are you there to begin with? Are you wanted there? You know, is you telling that story important to the people who are telling it to you? I think I would go to that. And then the idea of whether you could leave or not, I mean, I think I struggled with that for a very long time. And I would always go back, <laughs> I think. Um, but of course, the possibility to leave um, is always strong. And there's you know, stories of women being begged you to take their children to the camps where they die because they want them. They want them out of that situation. So I, I, yeah, I don't think I have an answer for that. 
other than I just kept churning. Oh, maybe to add on to, um, I really don't think that should be like a barrier to someone coming from how doing a research. I personally value what comes out of the research, and I appreciate it. Being it something that can be maybe controversial or maybe violent because it is pointing out to certain things that probably that has been silent and it is now coming out. And I particularly to me, the need to like do bridging of the generational gap came out of the research, which personally I took up as an initiative to do it. And I'm grateful that she supported. So I think the issues that normally come out of uh, come out of research should help us to really like appreciate research. And if there could be other avenue for doing something about the problem that is cropping up, that could be an area of more research. That's what I think. Do you think it's about like responsibility then? Like who the researcher is responsible to? Yeah. If the community wants them there, mm -hmm. and if it's valuable and useful, would that then make the other questions <laughs> that negate those questions or not negate them. I really don't think so. And, uh, honestly, I can't explain how, but I really don't think so. It shouldn't be like a responsibility for uh, a researcher. Yeah. Which one should it be? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, issues that come out of research. Okay, it shouldn't be a barrier. Question at the front, or we have room for two, two more questions, I think. Start with Shana, and then we'll come here. Um, first of all, thank you. It's been since your defense is the last time I think I actually heard you present on this research. And, and I, I just want to reflect on a little bit of what I heard, but it was glossed over, but it kind of had to do with what's the ethical dilemma, you know, in some ways, which is that when speaking to academics, Western academics. There seems to be, number one, as Augustine was saying, a lack of their, them recognizing their own positionality, right? So they're like, how is it possible that there is indigenous government? How is this this? How is there that, right? They don't recognize where they're coming from, you know, whether it has to do with answering a door, an unexpected door knock, or what you're reading, but also a fetishization of violence and a fetishization of, of poverty, and that that is what is important. So I guess what I'm asking, because it was also important for you to defend, it was important for you to graduate, it was important for you to publish in academic journals. How have you, and now, Augustine, now, now that you're in the academic world, how are you balancing these different understandings of what is important. I think it's just finding other scholars' work who have really grappled with this quite thoroughly and being able to acknowledge their work in this and what they have done and to be able to think with them in very different contexts, but in thinking about that ethical kind of issue. I think also part of it is questioning academia itself, which sounds really weird, but just wondering if I should be in academia. I think that was a large part of it. it was like, okay, yes, I've done six years of work to a PhD, but if I can't write this truth, then what is the point at all of doing so? Um, and I think part is just continuing. And so like there's one British journal that I've been in conversation with for two and a half years <laughs> about, you know, one of these elements about constitution writing. And it's just been a very protracted conversation about 
assumptions and what we're coming to thinking about conflict and post-conflict with. And, and I've just kept going. I've just, I haven't given up in a way, which I don't know if I would ever do that again. And I think writing to people who have an understanding of these different issues, which there are many people out there who write beautifully. Um, part of me, though, wanted to make that intervention into that British social anthropology, particularly because you know, that is what I learned, and that exists. And they you know, trusted me to represent them and tell that story. And so like it really it took two and a half years, and I'm finally at the point where I think I don't know if I should. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I, I don't know if that's an answer to that particular question. But I think part is making space in academia, in academia, for these for these conversations and these dialogues and these dilemmas, um, and then also for you know honoring the relationships that you are engaged in through research and learning. And there are other people doing it. There are like I'm definitely not alone in doing it. And so I think also connecting with those people and reading their work and understanding it across geography and across you know different fields is really important. Thank you very much. Um, joining academic world <coughs> helped me to like appreciate the research. And uh, I'm still learning more. <coughs> and I'm hopeful uh, if academic ethics, academic world can get to appreciate our backgrounds, our experiences, and uh, incorporate it into the body of uh, research work. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just love this frame poster of your lecture today. Oh, thank you. Our first one. Thank you.